That's absolutely right. In fact, that is captured in the, in the visioning document and, and, um, and one that actually is also captured in our integrated transport strategy. Because one, what's really going to be important here um, is that new traffic bridge should also have a dedicated rail bridge as well, which will, which will, which will ultimately run one of the passenger lines or one of the freight lines. Now, so the pedestrian bridge is the current old bridge. That's right. So this one here is, is the old bridge. And the truth of the matter is they'll probably have to take a section out of the middle here so they can get vessels through that they currently, so it'll be of a, but, but our view is they should retain as much of that as possible. And then there'll be a new traffic bridge, which the state government's done some work on, which will be both traffic and rail. Um, now that reason that's important is because this comes linked to the port. The port is growing very rapidly. We're at 700,000 containers come out of the port a year. They're looking at tracking to about 1.2 million containers within a few years. Now you can either try and get all those in and out in truck, which is a, a disaster for people who live on those roads and from all of us, or we can get more on rail. And the problem at the moment is that rail has to happen mostly at night because they can't squeeze them through the passenger trains because they're sharing a track. So they actually need a dedicated freight rail line so they can run those trains during the day and actually get more containers out of the port by rail, which is good for everybody. So absolutely support that. And that certainly is certainly captured in the detail on our integrated transport strategy and, and one that we're lobbying hard for. We have some major concerns that the Perth freight link, well, there's how long have you got? I'm not, I won't get a stock on this, but I, by the way, the council has some major concerns about it. I mean, from Billy Wetlands through to the fact that it just stops before Canning Highway. See, so a freeway just arrives at Canning Highway and the Stirling Bridge with no upgrades to the intersection, which of course is just going to shift a tra traffic jam from one area to another. But perhaps our longest term concern is that there's a danger that it becomes a Fremantle bypass. And that's actually, at the, and this is actually why, to come back to your bridge, why your bridge is really important, is that what we want is actually not a doubling of the Stirling Bridge, but an upgrade to the Fremantle traffic bridge, because that will get more people to come into Fremantle. And that's actually at the heart of what, what this is about. And the danger of the freight link is that it will just simply create a huge bypass that will encourage, that will funnel people around Fremantle, um, further damaging the city economically. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question and we, that work has been done at the moment. In fact, we're just going through the process of doing a new economic development strategy that's going to sit under this, um, which will tease out some of that detail. But I guess at the heart of that is to say that we consider ourselves a proper second city and that would, so that should have a range of office workers. So this is actually, and the reason we think a government department's important, not because it's bringing government workers down per se, but because that catalyzes a whole bunch of private sector people to, to, to really to follow on the back of that and actually start start to activate those areas. But there's no doubt Fremantle's already got its strengths. You know, if you look at things from design to architecture to media, there is, there's a whole range of strengths that we, that we have got, um, which I think we need to build on, because I think, you know, it's a really overused, and I, and I, and I say there's you know, the whole around creative class, people wanting, wanting to be in interesting areas. Fremantle has those ingredients, and I think it is that creative class that we do attract already, but I think we can even do a better job of actually attracting more. Um, and so that, that's probably where I see us going. Alongside that, inevitably, there's going to be a major jump in tourist activity. We, I mean, I haven't seen, be fair to say, Graham, the amount of applications for hotels that have come across our desks in the last year have I mean, I mean, I just think they can't all be built. There's just too many. I mean, so there's a, there's a huge push for tourism in, in, in Fremantle and associated industries. Look, that's going to be an important part of it. My passion is to make sure we don't just end up as a tourist town, but we end up as much more than that. So that's actually why we're actually attracting real jobs and real people seven days a week. So, and we'd love to have your involvement in the economic development strategy as we start to roll it out. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to add one thing that um, you talk about 2029. Um, the ageing population is a really significant factor here. And the opportunities in health particularly now that the Fremantle Hospital is, is changing its purpose. Um, the opportunities for a future uh, really strong economy around health, particularly age-related health, um, which is where the Fremantle Hospital is going, um, specialising in that field gives, a, this, gives Fremantle a great opportunity to actually become a really specialist medical centre town uh, attached to the Notre Dame University. So there are in fact lots of pillars to the economic opportunities for Fremantle. I think we just we need to be smart about 
where we put our energies, but the opportunities are boundless, really. But health is a really big one, and I think it's a really important one. Look, I think, I think that's a fair point. And I think there are, and that was an interesting, it was an interesting outcome of the visioning, actually, is that of all the people who came along, the overwhelming passion was for the Fremantle CBD and the changes they wanted to make there. I mean, is that, we, we didn't push out in any direction, as you're quite right. We didn't say you've got to focus on the suburbs or you've got to focus on the centre. We left it to those who are involved. And people are passionate about Fremantle and its centre, as they should be, because I think, to be honest with you, it's a, it's, it's, it, need, it needs some work. And that's actually... But, but, I guess what, but in response to you, are we just doing this you know, for businesses and the like? It'd be fair to say, I mean, if you took it in that really narrow sense, there's no doubt that businesses pay much more, many more rates than residents do. In fact, the more vibrant we make Fremantle, the, 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 actually the, the better the services we can offer for ratepayers, the less rates we have to charge ratepayers because you've got a vibrant core that actually can actually subsidise the rest. And that's just to give you an example. So, or at, or at the moment, Pat Graham knows this better than me, but we have about 3,000 rate, pay, rate 30,000 rate payers. Um, what is it? What is it? 30, sorry, it's about $3,000 per rate payer here. Yeah? So we, we raise about $3,000 per rate payer in Fremantle compared to about $1,200 per rate payer in the city of Melbourne. So because of, and that's not because we charge more rates, that's because we've got a commercial core, because we've got parking, because we've got a whole range of other things that actually mean that we've got much more economic ability to do things than we would otherwise. So that's actually, so just so you understand that it actually leads to greater financial capacity and I don't, I don't see it as an either raw between residents versus commercial or vice versa, it's actually very complimentary. I'll add to that, Paul. Um, I did mention at the start uh, the products that came out of this. The first product was the, was I guess the, uh, the data that was collected through that community visioning exercise uh, and that's been posted on the website. The, transforming, the transformative moves that you've seen tonight is pretty much focused on the CBD all year. Um, it'd be fair to say it's very strongly um, focused on how you get into the CBD as a resident and, and a visitor, um, which is really important to the economic wealth and wellbeing of the city. Um, but the next documentation, the next product that will come out of the exercise um, later this year will be the city's next five year strategic plan. Um, and it was always the purpose to actually have that strategic plan um, be much more focused on the suburban um, part of the city so that we, we can articulate better where we see our suburbs going and how we actually can, uh, the sorts of things that we can do for the suburbs. No, no apologies for this exercise, this is actually, is about the city centre and about the economic wellbeing of the city centre uh, and attracting people, whether they be visitors, whether they be workers, whether they be ratepayers bringing them into the city to make it a viable city. The point of, I guess, um, June, the point, um, the, the International Design Competition came up with this design. Um, it is, I mean, that's one, that's one drawing of it. Um, if, you, if I can show you the other plans, um, when, when they do get approved, um, it is actually better, seriously better than a ground floor library. When you put a ground floor library in, um, I think as Councillor Sullivan articulated in the uh, local paper, what you end up with um, is blinds or, or tinted windows so that no one can see in um, because you don't like the sunlight. The way this has been designed, they will be clear glass. It will be light and bright and visible um, and a much more enjoyable space naturally um, with water ponds um, on one side of it, on both sides. On both sides, yeah. On both sides. Water ponds on both sides. Um, it is a state of, it will be a state of the art library. Um, it will be the best library in the state. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of opinion. I, I respect that. Yeah. Um, but I will say to you, this, this will be the best library in the state. Well, I'll that, but on the grounds of accessibility. And just quickly respond that um, access is not a problem. I mean, it, it, it is a grand entrance off King Square uh, into the library. So it's through, yeah. um, you can either ramp it, steer it, or elevator it. Um, I mean, from an access point of view, um, it's no different to walking into the current library. Well, that's not true, but I won't argue. Yeah, okay. okay, so just don't explain the process. So we did an international architectural competition um, run by the rules of the Australian Architects body, P body. 
Um, and they actually, that meant that I wasn't on the panel, only architects were on the panel, and they ultimately made made a recommendation. So we had 60 odd applicants to start with that got shortlisted down to three who did detailed designs and then, and then, then that, that went through a process. And then a winner was chosen. So neither Graham and I were, were involved in, in choosing that winner. And they made the judgment that, um, that despite that or because of that, either way you want, we want to look at it, that that was still the best design given the, the city's criteria. And the city's criteria was we wanted a bigger library with better access and they, and they, and they viewed it met that criteria. So, so I guess it was one of those things where we can second guess. We could have gone back and started to second guess the architects and those kinds of things. I actually think this is a very a beautiful design and it does what it does enable is this grass this, this grass knoll which actually sit in the middle of the square. The library actually sits under that, so I have a huge rate, rake ceiling, two, two, two story um, ceiling. So it actually starts to enable some of those things. Um, and I think it, Graham's right, I think it will be beautiful. And I also understand June's concerns. And I'll be upfront with you, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, really? Um, but speaking to the architects and working through the detail of the design, I feel, I feel much more comfortable. And I, get, and I think it is going to be a pretty stunning outcome. Yep, no, I think it's a great question because it is actually, you're right, it's what makes Frio. And, and I, look, in fact, you know, it was, is it true? Yeah, 24 years ago when you were born, I, I first moved here um, and, and, you know, could rent a house for, you know, 40 bucks a week, a room for 40 bucks a week. You know, and, and, um, and that's, you know, and that, that's changed. You know, we, we the idea of, you know, renting right in the middle of Fremantle is almost impossible now if you're, if you're not earning a lot of money. That's, and if, so the affordability, both from a housing perspective and then from what you're talking about from actually a, a space perspective is absolutely very key. So, um, absolutely. So that, that's, that's not in this plan per se, um, but, but it certainly did come through the visioning and it, and it certainly came through, and it's certainly in our cultural development strategy as well. We're actually having those spaces and that's why we did, around the fly by night, take a really proactive role and say, we don't want to lose you guys from Frio. We've got a great space here in Victoria Hall. And, um, and look, that, that, that'll be a good outcome. We'll have the fly by night here. We'll have a whole range of other concerts by sunset events in, in the drill hall and hopefully other spaces. But, but I think what you've highlighted to me as well is I think that as, if this comes to fruition and this does gather momentum, we're going to probably even need to be more proactive in that space to make sure that we actually do get the right spaces and make sure we keep them so that the heart and soul of Fremantle is not lost through a, a slow process of gentrification. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, just want to add to that. Um, what the Brad Farmer mentioned was that we're actually um, advertising for a new manager of Art Powell, mm. Arts and Culture at the moment. Um, Fremantle, for 50 years, has been really lucky that the arts scene and the culture scene, um, music scene, has taken care of itself. We haven't had to be, the community and the council actually hasn't had to be all that proactive in that space. And, and the Mayor rightly points out, the, the big change has been the price of property um, to hire um, or buy. And it's caused a, a number of our artisans to move, whether it be music art or, or whatever, ceramics, whatever, to move out of the city um, because it's cheaper uh, and it's unaffordable to actually stay in a central freedom. We're, we're working on a strategy I'm starting to think about a strategy about how we can provide the space. Um, we recognise the arts and culture scene in Fremantle is one of its gems. It's absolutely one of its gems. And we don't want that to go to Rockingham or June Love or Midland or anywhere else. We want it to stay in Fremantle. And so we're actually structuring up our own capacity internally now to deal at a much higher level, at a much more strategic level with all the sectors of the arts um, and, that, and that whole scene, not just be reactionary the way we have been, even just lately, like panic, let's save the fly by night, panic, let's try and find out if we can save culture or deck chair or um, harbour theatre, um, all of which we haven't been able to actually find a home for. We don't want to be in that panic situation. We don't want to be reactive. We actually want to be ahead of the game. So we're actually gearing up um, as part of our 2010-2015 strategic plan. We've, we've done that to gear up. We've actually so we're out advertising now for that really um, a, a much more high level officer who who will have links into government, links into the arts organisations around actually bring it back on track a bit. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, my 
there's a couple of, you know, for those of you who didn't hear the question, the question around live exports and, and the future of that. I mean, there is, certainly the council has a very strong position of opposing live exports and, and actually saying they should be moving to a, a, a chilled meat industry. It's fair to say our influence in that area is pretty limited um, and they're likely to continue. Um, look, there's certainly some changes afoot at the, at the port. I mean, I'm on, my personal view is hiding it in Quinana is not a good thing for that industry if you want it to disappear. But there's no doubt that, that ultimately having scrap metal, cars and, sh and sheep down on some of the best waterfront land in, in, in the state is probably not, is not the best use of that land either. And it would be a really compelling logic for moving all of those, whilst, whilst keeping a container port here, moving all of those industries down to James Point, Quinana Way would actually make a lot of sense. Um, and I think government should consider that seriously. I mean, it, it just, it just is, is a really silly use using that land um, on Victoria Quay for parking cars, which is where the passenger terminal also is. So there's just a, there's a huge amount of potential there, but, but certainly my only fear for that is that you put live sheep out of sight and out of mind and we'll have a trade forever, which is something that I personally don't agree with. And you know what, some good news. We, we, we planned it especially, they started work today. Yeah, they started today, finally. <laughs> no, police station is, is still in planning stage. So I must say, it's not, when we say we, the council doesn't control this process. The heritage, the state heritage office, have now taken that off the Department of Housing. This is the Waters Cottages. Um, and they've actually been quite good and have fast-tracked some work and they've started the scaffolding went up today, and that, so they're starting some initial work on re refurbing those. There'll be a debate around the longer term uses of those, um, because probably, to be honest with you, at least a year or two of work to actually to fix those up. They, they, were, they were let to let run down badly. The police station and that whole complex where the old court is, is another really great precinct. Um, that, in my view, and I'd be fair to say the city's view, we think it shouldn't be used for residential purposes, is a really good use for that, which could be, again, a hotel use, a historic hotel use, it could be some other, it could be arts use, in fact, we did do a walk around with, with Art source and a range of others for that, for that area, because there's, it, it, and, but for our view, I mean, just turning it into residential be, w w wouldn't, but wouldn't be the best use, but government wants to dispose of that asset, and they're going through their, like we found out with government office accommodation moving to Fremantle, government processes are long, um, so they're going through that disposal, that process, where they will probably on-sell that to, 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 to somebody. Yeah, no, it, it, look, there is, there's one of those tensions that you do need to manage. Um, but my sense is lots of cities around the world do it. I mean, they have, they, they have lots more people daytime and nighttime. Attracting more people at nighttime is it makes the city safer. I mean, I actually feel like, I mean, in, does. yeah, I mean, in fact, George is here who, who runs the, the Sunset Markets down here. And that's when that area feels the best is when it's full on a Saturday night full of people. I mean, and that, that's for me actually really, really exciting. And that's where I see this, this area where imagine the J Shed actually um, you know, got things happening there, probably maybe has bands playing there, um, and then ultimately you've got something happening on Victoria Key, and it's actually a proper well-lit, linked, full of people path through, through that amazing part of Fremantle. That at the moment, on the, probably on most nights, you don't really feel that comfortable walking through. Um, on the Wi-Fi one, look, that, that's been rolling out and um, pretty, pretty well and pretty widely, um, and it's not entirely linked up across the city yet. But it'd be fair to say the Wi-Fi map's one that's increasingly taking shape. But we actually, I've actually resisted what rolling it out across the whole city, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is looking outside here, you will see that there's a whole bunch of backpackers out there right now who are who, who are skyping family back home and, and the like. Um, we actually wanted to pick key areas we wanted to activate and bring people to and make feel safe again by having people there. So we actually, we didn't need people on the Cappuccino Strip, there were already people there. So it actually was about focusing on key areas where we wanted to bring people back to. So actually using Wi-Fi as a place to, as a placemaking tool, rather than just simply as a communications tool. And I guess that, that's actually why it is targeted in some areas and, and, and not, not others. Thank you very much. And thank you to you all for questions. Certainly, Graham and I will, will um, be hanging around and happy to have a chat with you. Tony's provided food, so please make sure that gets eaten. And um, thanks again for your part in futures and Fremantle's future. Thanks. <laughs>